You guys sounded rowdy up here. It sounded good, man. It sounded good. I think you all know how to keep a beat, too. You know how to keep a beat. Let's kill that. I know it's a good song, right? Yeah, I, I guess I'm missing out because everyone, I, I, I stumbled upon that song, and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Everyone's like, yeah, I've been listening to that on Z for like three months. So I guess I need to turn on my radio once in a while. But man, that is a good tune, isn't it? I love that song. Well, I want to welcome you all here in, in person, and uh, for those that are watching online, I want to welcome you as well, kind of, sort of. Um, I want to say hello to my, to my pastor, uh, Pastor Ralph Howe, who uh, he called me last night to just encourage me, and I appreciate that so very much. We all need that once in a while, and uh, he said he, uh, he goes online on Sunday evenings, and he scrolls through, and he catches uh, my, my messages, and... Uh, you know, that's just awesome, and here's a guy who led, helped lead me to Christ, and I look up to him very much so, and he take, that he would take the time and listen to what I have to say is, uh, is an honor, so hey, Ralph, what's up? Um, do me a favor and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, all right? Grab one. There's Bibles everywhere. If you have one of your own, I think that's totally awesome, um, Grab your Bible, grab your notebook, grab your fake Bible on your phone if you want to, whatever you want to do, just get to Acts chapter 13, and we're going to continue in this series called To the Ends of the Earth, and what are we looking for in, in this series? We're looking for truth shared, right, and examples shown, so we want to know uh, what it looks like to respond to Jesus when he walked this earth. You read the Gospels, including Luke's first book, and he tells us about what Jesus said and where he went and how he saw it and what he did and what he taught and what he expects of us and all those things. And then we go to the book of Acts as the follow-up to his Gospel of Luke, and we see how the people responded to all that they heard in the first book. And that's why we're... The gospel, uh, the gospel of Luke we did, and then now we're studying through the book of Acts, okay? So while you're turning to Acts chapter 13, I want to I wanna, uh, share another verse with you. You don't have to look it up in, the, in, in your Bible, but I think, do we have it up on the screen? Do we have it up on the screen, uh, Romans 8, 37? We, yeah, 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 right, this is, this is a great word right here, right? Listen, 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 we need this more than ever right now because we had a crazy world. Everyone think we're living in a crazy world? Living in a crazy world, but look, eight, Romans 8, 37 says this, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Anyone happy about that? That's awesome, right? We're, 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 we have overwhelming victory, but listen, listen, notice the wording. We don't just rush through the Bible. If you're just reading through the Bible, you're making a mistake, okay? Don't rush through the Bible. Look at the verbiage that the Holy Spirit uses. The Bible presupposes our victory. Look at the exact wording. Victory uh, is, someone say is. is, victory is ours, right? Not might be yours, could be yours, should be yours, it, what? It is ours, right? So, so and, and before, before that verse comes up in your Bible, what you're going to see is Paul listing a bunch of bad stuff, right? And we're going through some bad stuff right now. So most of you last week admitted that this is the craziest time in the history of this country, or at least your lives. So, so you can probably relate to what Paul's saying here in Romans chapter 8, where he says that there could be trouble, there could be calamity, persecution, you might face hunger, you might be destitute, there might be danger, and you might be even threatened with your life. There could be death for you. But he says, despite all those things, like, they may not go away. They may last for a day. They may last for a month. They may last forever. But despite all those things, over, well, not just a slight victory, a blowout, right? Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Amen. Amen, Spot. All right. So we're supposed to live in victory. That doesn't mean we're supposed to be loaded. That doesn't mean we're going to be living forever without any sickness or disease or trouble or calamity or persecution or hunger or destitute or maybe even death. But even so, 
I am victorious in Christ. What's the worst that could happen? Listen, loved ones, I don't say this lightly. I could get corona today and be dead next week. But despite that, overwhelming victory is mine in Christ. You understand? Because I get to be in glory, right? Where there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness, no more tears, no more death. I'm going to be having a great day. One of the, you know what one of the graces of heaven is? You don't remember anything that's bad. You don't remember. Listen, I know you're praying for people to come to know the Lord. And you love them and you want them to know Jesus so bad. But when you step into glory, you won't remember that that dude kept saying no. Because you're going to be having a great day. So, so listen, we, we, no matter what happens, and that should make people fearless. Because no matter what happens in this world, overwhelming victory is yours in Christ who loves you. Right? Isn't that a, that's what the world needed to see. We, 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 we're, we're participating and helping them see this, but the church laid down, and, they, and we had an opportunity to show the world that no matter what happens, Corona, you come after me and I die, I'm still victorious in Christ. You just sent me to heaven. Thanks, dude. Like, that's what people need to see. This is my buddy John Tompkins at one fire. He said, yesterday we're out there on the signs. We're holding signs on 441, letting people know that they love him. Thousands of people going by. There was probably 30, 40 of us holding up signs, a bunch of different churches. You are loved. Jesus loves you. Jesus heals. Stop for prayer. All this stuff, right? And he told me, he goes, I don't understand. He's young. I mean, I'm, I'm young to Christ. I led him to the Lord, so he's real young. But he's pastoring a church right now. He goes, and he's kind of still like me, kind of a little naive, but that's good sometimes. He's like, yeah, I don't understand people. This is like basic Jesus right here. What are they afraid of? What, why are they afraid to go to church? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm like, yeah, dude, I don't know either. I think they've all lost their minds. But as another brother this morning told me, maybe God's doing a little separating between the real and the phony. And we're going to figure out who's really a believer and who's not. I mean, I'm not, listen, I'm going sideways here, but... I've been online, I have a brother who's been watching, right? And I'm quoting scripture, and they're still saying no. But God gave you a mind for common sense. I'm like, yeah, common sense means to obey the word of God. That's what the Bible says, that you're supposed to listen to the word. So God gave you a brain, right? Not so that your common sense would, 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 would contradict God, right? So the God-given con common sense that he gives you will contradict the God-given word that he gave? Does that make any sense at all? I'm dumb and I get it. Okay? So, so, so we have to just, we have to plow forward obeying the word of God all the time. Overwhelming victory is ours in Christ who loves us no matter what happens. Okay? Live that way today, loved ones. Walk out these doors today with an attitude all over you that says, I don't care if I get whacked by a bus, I'm having a great day, right? The world sees that. What are they going to do? They're going to want you, dude. They're going to want to figure out what you have when Paul's in jail, and he's singing to the Lord after he gets beaten by wooden rods, and he's singing. What made all the prisoners get led to the Lord? Because they were saying, they're crazy. That's what they were saying. They're insane. They just got beat up with, with baseball bats, and they're singing to the God who's supposed to protect them. Yeah, if I died, I would have gone to be with them. Like, that's awesome. Win-win. Win-win. The world sees that. They're going to ask you why you're crazy. Let them know why you're a Jesus freak. Okay? So we're supposed to live in victory. I got to catch my breath, bro. I'm not 25, 30 anymore. <laughs> this is getting tougher. <laughs> One of the best tools that we have for victory over an opponent is the element of surprise in all areas of life, right? The element of surprise kind of puts your adversary off guard a little bit because if they don't know how to prepare for you, right, they can't be ready to defend themselves. Would you agree to that? That's why, like, in sports, right, it's like that. They, why, why, do they, why do we huddle in, in football, right? Is it not to keep the play that you're about to run a secret from the other team? Because it catches them off guard. They don't know what to do. That's why you see the linebackers going like this. And they're trying to figure out which way the play is going because they don't know. And that's why the coach, when he's getting ready to, to announce his play to his teammate, to his, to, his, to his team, you see him, he covers his mouth with his playbook, right? You see him do that? Why? Because there's people on the other side, Bill Belichick, that are looking at his lips, from New England, I can say that. 
<laughs> just like I'm the only one who can make Jewish jokes in here, y'all. No, <laughs> just kidding. But you cover your mouth, right, so that they can't hear your play, so that you can kind of catch them off guard a little bit, right? That's why, the, like military, there's like secret codes and stuff like that. And so they've got, they've got branches of the military that, that that's all they do all day is try to decipher what the enemy is trying to say so we can figure out what their plan is so we know how to defend ourselves and win. But once in a while, this is kind of cool, once in a while, someone so awesome comes along and all that gets thrown right out the window. And, and they start trash talking, right? I love trash talk. I love trash talk. So I'm from Massachusetts, right? And so I grew up, I was a Celtic fan. I'm a, I am a Celtic fan. And uh, I'm not a Patriots fan, really. But see, lifelong Patriots fans are now, go Bucks, go Bucks. Like, what's wrong with you people, right? <laughs> and, uh, well, we're going to be a Bucks fan until, the Patri- till, till Brady retires, Pathetic, right? I'm a Celtic fan, and and so when I was growing up, though, uh, Larry Bird was the guy, right? You guys all remember Larry Bird? People in here probably remember Larry Bird. I'm not saying he was the greatest. I'm not saying he was the best. I'm not saying any of that. He was just awesome, right? He was known for a lot of different things. But one of the things he used to do all the time is all these last-second shots to win games. Like, he was Mr. Clutch, right? You needed a win. You got the ball to Larry, and somehow, some way, he's going to stick it in your face, and he's going to win the game, right? So there was one game. I was watching this online this past week. I'm kind of on a Larry Bird kick. I don't know why, but uh, better than the cage fighting kick that I'm usually on. And so, pray for me, I went from that to bare knuckles. It's getting worse. But, uh, so I'm watching this Larry Bird stuff, right? And, and there's, this, there's this one game, it's an amazing story. He's a trash talker, man. He could back it up, though. That's the thing with a, with a trash talker. You, if you could back it up, you could talk all the trash you want, right? So, so, so Larry Bird, right, he hits us. They're down by two. They're playing the Seattle Supersonics. They're down by two. And with three seconds left in the game, he shoots a three-pointer to win the game. So he thought. What he didn't know is that his coach at the time, Casey Jones, who was a great Celtic, just before the ball was released from his hands, he called a timeout. Because he wanted to draw up a play that would be most effective so they could win, give a good chance of winning. Well, the shot went in, and Larry thought it was over, and he raised his hands, only to find out the whistle had blown and it's a timeout. So he falls to his knees... And he puts his hands on his head, you know, and he just bows out like, oh, I can't believe, you know, like totally bummed out, as you would be, right? You hit the game-winning shot, three seconds left, three-pointer. No one thinks you're going to get it. It goes in, and it doesn't count. Like totally dis- wind out of the sails, blood out of your heart, you're done, right? So the other team, Seattle, they start taunting him a little bit, as most would do in sports, like, ha, 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 you didn't win, Right? He gets up, he looks at Xavier McDaniel, who was a great player at the time, who was guarding him during that shot, who was now making fun of him because it didn't count. He looks at him, he says, listen, we're going to run the same play, and I'm going to get the ball right there, and I'm going to shoot it in your face. And he did. And they won. The same exact play. He let the play out. He put all of his cards on the table. And he still did it. And when you're that kind of guy, you can trash talk all you want, right? You're that good. So listen, let's talk about the greatest trash talker of all time. And you knew we were going to get here, right? Before, don't stone me when I say this. Jesus Christ was the greatest trash talker of all time, right? Don't stone me, hear me. This is what he said, right? In Matthew 20, he says this out loud. Everyone always, I don't know if there's any theological uh, precedence to this or a foundation, but people say, if you say it out loud, then the devil can hear it. But if you don't say it out loud, then he can't. Jesus said out loud, I'm going to get handed over to the authorities. They're going to whip me, beat me, kill me, bury me, and I'm going to rise again. And then in Matthew 16, 18, he says, and then I'm going to build my church. And here's the trash talk. Hell won't stop me. Right? And he did. And so when Jesus says something, he can trash talk all he wants because he can back it up. And he has been for 2,000 years. And you're proof of it because you're sitting here in Leesburg, 6,500 miles away, worshiping this Jesus. Right? So he can trash talk all that he wants. He can back it up. He can back it up. Now listen, 
Jesus' victory personally and our victory in him, he never said that victory was going to be easy. He just said it was going to be certain. That's a good place for an amen. He said it would be certain. See, the incredible challenge and the pain that would come with it of the cross, that didn't stop Jesus from completing his mission. He kept pressing on and pressing on to Jerusalem. No matter what, this is the plan. I have to do it. I know it's going to be awful. I don't want to do it. Anyone have God tell them to do something that they didn't want to do? Anyone? Like every day of every page that you read, stuff you don't want to do. And Jesus had something in his flesh, in his, in his humanity, he didn't want to do because he knew what was going to happen. I'm going to get whipped and beaten and the Father's going to look away from me and, and sort of have some disappointment in me because he who knew no sin didn't just absorb sin, he became sin so that you could have, you could be, uh, you could be the righteousness of God in him. I lost myself for a second. He became sin, so he knows it's going to be rough. So rough that just moments before this is all going down, he's in the garden praying. He's like, oh, man, Father, this is, this is not going to be good. Like, if there's any other way to accomplish this thing, like, I know it's going to be bad. I don't want to do it, but your will be done. But your will be done. And no doubt death and hell and Satan were excited when Jesus is on the cross and his head drops and says, it's finished. And they're probably thinking, man, we got this guy now. He said this, but we killed him. And they were probably high-fiving each other and, and giving each other knucks when they actually buried the dude. But that didn't stop him, did it? See, we all know what happens on Easter Sunday morning, right? Resurrection! Resurrection! So, if this is Jesus' story, press forward, get pushed back. Whoa. Press forward, get pushed back. Press forward, push back. Press forward, push back. That's his story, right? Shouldn't that be our story? That should be our story too. Because we're supposed to what? Be like him, talk like him, think like him, go like him, be like him. Actually not even living anymore, but he lives in us. So if he lives in us and that's his story and that's his mission of push forward, get pushed back, push forward, push back. That should be our story as well, right? So listen, listen, listen. Here, here I want to I reference you to, we're going to get to Acts 13, I promise you. I want, to, I want to reference 2 Corinthians 5.19 because, listen, if a preacher gets up in any church you ever go into and he starts making some claims, especially if they're kind of crazy, you should see it in the Bible. You should see it in the Bible. Prove it to me, preacher. I want you to tell me that. Prove it to me, preacher. Come on. Prove it. My wife, of course. <laughs> Prophet is honored everywhere except. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.19 through 20. Not saying I'm a prophet. Listen, ready? Watch this. Should be like, it was his story, should be our story. That's what I said, right? His story should be our story. His story should be our story. Watch. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Pause. Erp. That's what he was doing, right? What was God doing? He's in Christ. The fullness of deity is pleased to dwell in Christ. Jesus Christ comes down from heaven. God is totally all up in this person who's walking around in skin. He is God in the flesh. God is in Jesus reconciling people back to God. That's why Jesus came, to reconcile the world, the human race, back to God, right? Right. So that's the race that he was running, was it not? Now, look at the verse goes on to say, right after the period. And he gave us, who's us? Raise your hand. Us, right? You, us. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us, right? So you see the baton got passed. Jesus was doing it, right? He was reconciling people back to God. And now, verse 18, very, very clear, God has given us this task of, rec of reconciling people to him. So you can see it there. That's the race that Jesus was running. Push forward, get pushed back. Push forward, get pushed back. And push forward afresh. And then he hands the baton off to us. And then we are to experience and do the same that Jesus did, right? You see it there in the text. 
He was in Christ reconciling the world back to him. And now he's given us the job of reconciling people back to him. Because Christ lives in you, the hope of glory, right? That's your job. So that, that should be, that's the pattern. Whatever he did, whatever race he was running, that should be the race that you and I as followers of Christ should be running. If you've bent the knee to Jesus and said yes to his salvation, he's your savior, you've bent the knee to him as Lord of your life, then the life that Jesus lived should be the life that you as a Christ follower, as a Christ inhibitor, will live. Does that make sense? So, before we read Acts 13, we're getting there, I promise you, I want to this stuff should be all over the Bible because it adds more credibility to the, to the claim, right? If you get one verse that just kind of says something, kind of, sort of, maybe, maybe. But if you want to form like a whole lifestyle like I'm trying to instruct you to do uh, upon something, you should see it all through the Bible, shouldn't you? You should see it all through the Bible, right? So how about Peter? Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. You see it there on the screen. Uh, that's the page number in the pew Bibles that are there. And so you can turn there and you can read it along with me. It's always good to put your eyes on God's word yourself so you know that I'm not making anything up. So listen, look at what Peter says. You're going to be like, yeah, that's the same. He says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through. Right? Jesus went through them, right? He pushed forward. He got pushed back. He pushed forward afresh. He got pushed back. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you, right? So there's, you, get, you get to see the play. You get to see the play. So when you see the play of the enemy, you can get ready for it. Prepare yourself to fight afresh and effectively because you know that this is coming. If you didn't know it was coming, you'd be like, oh, man, why does this keep happening to me? And why do I keep going through all this? And why do I, why, why, why? And when, 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 I, all, I do it too. But we all do it, right? Why am I going through all this? Why am I going through all this? Listen, loved ones, don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through. It's not to hurt you. There's benefit. Watch. This is where when the scriptures say, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Okay? Thought change right here. You ready? Are you ready to receive a thought change? Okay. Fiery trials are expected and fiery trials are good. Here's why. You ready? Watch this. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, right? I just told you that. It's good. Be glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, right? There's a, there's a, there's a benefit there, right? Like, I, you get to be a partner with Christ. Like, how many people would like to be partners with the guy who owns Amazon right now? Yeah, that'd be kind of cool, right? I was going to say Bill Gates, but half of you would probably go, no, right now. He's not, you know, you might love him, you might hate him not right now. Yeah, I could have said in, ba- in past days, I could have said Trump. Half of you will say yes. Half, but but, but, but the, the Amazon guy, nobody hates him yet. So today, it would be good to be partners with him. Okay, but how about being partners with Larry Bird? That would have been cool. But now you get to be partners with Jesus Christ. Right? That's, that's better. But listen, okay, yeah, and in church, of course you're going to say, well, yeah, I want to be partners with Jesus. That's the Sunday school answer. But there has to be a why. Why would you want to be a partner with Jesus, right? Well, here's why. The verse goes on to tell us why. Why should we be glad, God? Why should we be glad? Why should we want to be a partner with Christ in his suffering? Doesn't sound like much fun. Well, here it is. The verse goes on to say, <clears throat> so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. That's why. Listen, loved ones. One day, Jesus Christ is going to cut the clouds and come back. And all of us who have 
gone through the struggle and the trials and the suffering of advancing Christ's kingdom, giving generously, sacrificing, willing to even lose relationship, willing to lose houses and cars and friends and and health and all those things, willing to suffer to advance Christ's kingdom. All those people will be filled with joy when the clouds cut open and Jesus comes back. Those people will. Those people will. The ones who are on Christian Easy Street, I have news for them. They might not be on Christian Street at all. Listen, Romans 8, 17 says this. And since we are his children, we are the heirs of his glory, co-heirs with Christ. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Listen, No suffering, no seeing. That's the word of the Lord. That's not me. If you're going to enjoy the glory and the heaven and the awesome and the woo, right? You have to share in the suffering with Christ. And and listen, it says here, I just want to read this to you again. You're partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Okay? You want that? I want that. And I want that for you. Okay? So, that's the foundation for our study here today. And so let's see, right? Let's just see in the text if there's a pattern of push forward, push back. Push forward, push back, right? We should see if the preacher, again, if he's going to come up here and say something, make a claim, and you're going to have to adjust your life around this. Because, listen, when I come to church on the weekends, I don't know about you, but I come with high expectations. I come with high expectations, and I am just crazy enough to think that when we share the word of God with you, that you're going to leave here going, you know what, I'm changing my life based upon what I heard. That's why we study a lot. That's why we're trying to accurately divide the word of truth because I don't want to steer you down a wrong road that's going to cause undue harm. I want you to, I want you to be blessed. I want you to be favored, right? I want, I want you to live in victory. So, so I want you to, to, to approach the text like this. Is there something in my life that's not lining up? And if I'm not lining up with this, then I need to change my life and I will change my life according so the you should be able to see this pattern in the book of acts now i just want to say i told you to turn to acts 13 and we're going to go there right now but i also want to say that we're going to study acts 13 and 14 this morning the reason why is because the headings in bibles like these 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 chapter breaks and numbers and stuff those aren't uh those aren't divine those are bible translators sectioning off places so that we could find things and I'm very help- I'm, I'm thankful for those you should be too and, and I'm grateful that they've made those things but they're not of God and and so I'm not going to change the Bible at all I would just say if I was going to translate a Bible I probably would have made 13 and 14 one chapter because as we, you're going to see here in this chapter this is the story all both chapters of the story of Paul and Barnabas as they are called to do their ministry and it's all one continuous story. It's, it's not one and then another. It's just a continuous story. And I think that adds credibility to what we're saying here this morning because now we don't just have a verse or a paragraph or even a chapter. We have got two entire chapters of the book of Acts that are telling this story of push forward, push back. Push forward, push back. Okay? So let's start here at Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Are you there? I would hope so. That took a long time to get there. (laughs) Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean, and Saul. Saul would be Paul, okay? Same guy. Saul becomes Paul later on. Saul and Paul. Saul and Paul, same guy. All those guys are there. And one day as these men were worshiping, so you see them there together, right? We talked about that last week. As we're confronted in our culture right now about corporate gathering, we see that they are gathering together. These men, plural, were there together. And as they, those men were worshiping the Lord and fasting together, the Holy Spirit said, 
dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. Okay, so what we see there is a, is a stamp of approval from the Holy Spirit of God on the gathering of the people because he actually spoke into the gathering, right? It wasn't just when some guy was in his prayer closet, okay? It's not when, and it doesn't have to, listen, I want to <laughs> say something, okay? <sighs> I think I said this again the, uh, a week or two ago, but I want to say it again, okay? There's no such thing as when two or more are gathered in his name that I'm there in the midst, okay? That's not a gathering thing, okay? That's a church discipline thing. Look it up in the Bible, and the last I checked, it doesn't take two people to put the presence of God there. Because he said, I will be with you forever, right? That doesn't mean that I'm going to be with you forever as long as Haley's with you. That means I'm going to be with you forever. So you can have church by yourself, okay? You don't need two or more people gathered. That's their excuse for not going to a gathering. Well, me and my wife are sitting at home. And, that, and so God is there. No, no, no. He was there before you showed up, yo. He was there when your wife was sitting there before you got home from work. He was there. Okay, so you don't need the two or more gathered thing anymore. Stop using it as an excuse for blowing off church. All right, are we clear? So let's just move on. <laughs> so he speaks in the gathering, and he says, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work which I have called them to. So after more fasting and praying, the men, plural, laid their hands on them. How are you going to do that if you're not together? Um, Trevor Black, can I lay hands on you when you're at your house and I'm at mine? That would be a resounding no, thank you, okay? So they laid hands on them and sent them on their way, okay? So first things first, we see that in the church, we know that God calls us together, and as he places us together perfectly, and as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. So when he calls us together like he called these guys together, we see that moving forward, some people are going to stay in their church, right? Some of you are going to get carried out for the last time in a box, right? That's just the way it's going to be, right? But some people are called, once they're called to a place, sometimes the Holy Spirit calls you to be a go guy. And that doesn't mean you go to church to church trying to change that church into your image. That means you go like here, Saul and Barnabas get called by the Holy Spirit, not to church jump, but to go and tell people who have never known about Jesus, about Jesus, and then we'll continue in the book of Acts, you'll see that that calling means to plant new churches, and as we'll see, to appoint elders over those churches to oversee their operation, okay? That's what we see there. So, that's their calling, right? Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gift, God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable, and I've heard so many people in my short time as a Christian say, well, I felt when I was younger that God had called me to do this or that, but I, I didn't do it, and I was stubborn, and I'm rebellious, and I, I missed that, and I should have done it. Listen, 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 loved ones. You may be lazy, you may be stubborn, but the word of God, which means more than your feelings, amen, said that his calling on your life is irrevocable. So he didn't take it off of you, you just need, listen, there's a test right now you can take to see if you're still able to fulfill the calling that he's given you. Go like this. <sighs> Do you feel breath on your hand? Then it's not too late. If he called you back in the day when you were young, he's calling you still today. His calling on your life and the gift to accomplish it is irrevocable. Okay, if he gave it to you, you got it, go do it. That's it, period, end of issue. Okay, so, the, so gifts and calling source, where is it? What's the source? God. One person knows. Anybody else know? God. God. Right. Yes. Barnabas and Saul had a special call. You can see it there in the text, right? They had a special call for the special work to which I have called them. So they were called to be the go guys. They're, the, they're called to, to leave this particular body there in Antioch and go and tell, and plant, and appoint elders, right? That was their job. But what about the rest of us sitting here at home? What about our special call? What are we supposed to do? Well, whether we stay or whether we go, we're all under a call. And it's called the Great Commission. Every single one of us. Now listen, 
You may not be called to leave your home and go to another city to tell people who don't know and plant a church there. If you are, maybe there's some people in this room right now that are going to be called out of this church to plant a new church out of this church in another city. I don't know. When the Holy Spirit tells me, I will let you know. I know there's people in this church right now that have been quiet in the past, but they're starting to sprout up some and do some things, right? And God has called them to do some special work, at least for now, in this church, maybe later outside this church. I don't know. But he's calling people, and if you're not being called, you have to wonder, am I one of his? Every one of his will get a call, and if you're to stay, you're still called by the Great Commission. The calling is this, go make disciples, Right? Even if you don't have to go to another city, another state, another country, you don't necessarily have to go on the mission field in Cuba or Indonesia or, or Burma or wherever those places are. Like you might not go there, but you're still called to make disciples. You're told by Jesus to share. That's what do you do? How do you make a disciple? You share the gospel with them. You, every single one of us is under the call to let people in our circle of influence know of their sin condition, that they are born sons and daughters of Adam, they are filled with sin, there's nothing they can do to fix it, it's, 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 it's broken and you can't fix it, but God loves you so much that he sends his son to pay for your sin, and if you'll embrace Jesus and what he did on the cross for you and bend your knee to him as Lord. Lord of your life, right, then it can be fixed. That's the gospel. You just got it right there, right? That was pretty easy. Is there anyone in this room that thinks they couldn't do what I just said? Everyone's a minister. Isn't that awesome, right? Get after it. So, so, so we're supposed to share the gospel and make disciples, and then you're supposed to call the pastor up and tell him that he should baptize them, right? Uh, who's supposed to baptize them? The one who made the disciple, right? Right? Absolutely. Take them to your bathtub. Take them to your pool. I don't care. Take them wherever you want. Take them here and use that old scummy water that's been sitting there for three weeks. Do whatever you want, right? If you get a, a, a virus and die, overwhelming victory is mine in Christ, right? Woohoo! Good thing you baptized them. Listen, you share the gospel, you make a disciple. Right? Then it goes on to say after you make the disciple and baptize them, then you're supposed to teach him to obey all that I've commanded you. So whatever God has taught you, right, has God taught you some things? You got a Bible, right? He's taught you some things. So whatever he's taught you, then you're supposed to go find someone else, some other trustworthy person, who can share it with them so they can in turn share it with other people, right? That's what Meredith says every single week that we're supposed to be doing here as a church. We make, let's try it, let's have a trial run here so when she gets up, we knock it out of the park. You ready? We make disciples who make disciples. You owe me. <clears throat> she already pre prepaid for that with a white lasagna the other day. No, you did not. <laughs> Joseph, Kaylee, don't tell him you did. You'll make a brother stumble. Just don't say it. <laughs> okay, so, so, so we're supposed to make disciples and then ongoing Bible teaching relationships with someone, right? So if you've known Jesus for a little while, more than three weeks, let's give grace for the rookie, right? If you've known Jesus for more than three weeks, you own a Bible, you're ready to make a disciple, right? You don't have to have all the answers. You guys come to this church every week, and I don't have all the answers. So you, you, can, you can do this, right? Just go find someone in your world and say, let's have coffee. We have a coffee house here. We're making it easy for you, right? Bring them here. I'll make them a latte. Guy will make them a latte. And, and sit down, crack open the old book, and teach them to obey all that Jesus has taught you. That's, do you see the multiplication going on here? If you leave it up to just me, we're going to be ineffective forever. If we're ever going to live out the potential that God has for this church, every one of you is a minister. Go make disciples and then sit next to them and help them understand who Jesus is, who they are. Walk beside them. Help them. Nurture them. Grow their gifts with them. Right? Teach them and then release them to go do the same exact thing. That's what we're doing on Wednesdays. Tuesdays and Wednesdays here, and I think Mondays with, with your girls, right? So that's what we, it's Thursday, I don't know when it is. So that's what we do, right? So we're, we're doing this thing called the journey. 
And so we're walking through this thing, like real basic, fundamental stuff. Like, what does it mean to be saved? Right? I mean, have you ever wondered that? Like, people say that all the time. Like, what's it mean to be born again? That's kind of weird. I know them born again people. They're kind of weird, right? What does it mean to be born again? What does prayer mean? What does it, what's all this mean, right? So we're taking some young, fresh disciples through that. And, and as we continue to go through that, what we're asking those that are in that class is instead of adding people to that class so that I can disciple them or Meredith can disciple them. No, we want you to disciple them, right? You, get, you start getting, I don't know how many people are in this room right now, 30, 40 people. You get all of you making disciples, we're going to have to order some chairs, right? If we leave it up to me, we're probably enough. This is about all I can do right here, right? But you guys start getting after it. We're going to have to do something. And isn't that what you want? Isn't that what God wants? Isn't it his desire that not a single would perish and all would come to salvation and understand the truth? Isn't that what he wants? Don't ever tell me it's not about numbers. Everyone's a big number. Okay? Everyone's a big number. So, we make disciples. We teach them to obey all that I've commanded, ongoing Bible teaching. We've all been called. We've all picked up the baton as he ended his race, in a sense, here on earth in his body. Still our, still our coach, right? Still our coach. But he's passed on the baton to us. So let's look for the pattern here in Acts 13. So look first in Acts 13, verse 5. Um, Barnabas and Saul, they go out. They're sent out by the Holy Spirit, of course, and they get to these places island of Cyprus, there in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues, and what do they do? What's the first thing they do? Preach, right? Preach. What are we doing? We're preaching, right? We're preaching. That's what we do. That's God's way of passing on the good news. Preach. Tell them. Open your mouth. Caruso. Herald. Tell them the truth, right? That's what we're supposed to do. He goes to the synagogue, and he preaches the word of God. That's what he did. And he took this guy, John Mark, with him as their assistant. Okay? So, so there's the push forward, right? There's the call to preach, to move forward. That's what we're supposed to do. So we should see pushback, right? Look in verse 8. You see it there? But Elimas, this Bar-Jesus guy, this sorcerer, the sorcerer, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and, and Saul said. Why? He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Don't we have a force in this world that's still trying to do that? Keeping people from believing. Right? And when he says that he interfered and urged, that doesn't mean he was sitting in his closet going, Oh, I hope he doesn't listen to them. I hope he doesn't listen to them. I hope he doesn't No, he was actually opening his mouth probably, wouldn't you say? Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it like safe to assume he was saying something to this, to this guy? Sergius Paulus, I think his name was. The governor like, hey, don't listen to them. They're, 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 they're stupid. They're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them, right? And the world is always doing that. We're always getting opposition to the gospel through people saying, be quiet, be quiet, right? Quiet. Save it for your church congregation. Save it for Sunday. Be quiet. Don't listen to them, right? Hear it all the time. Man, I hear it all the time because I'm a big mouth. So I like to say stuff, right? And, and heaven forbid we're all quiet. I was listening to a message last night. And I watched the, the rest of it this morning. Super encouraged by that. Um, Pastor James McDonald, he was preaching again. And he talking about how, you know what? We're, we're at war, man. Whatever happened to, to Paul talking to Timothy about, about being a Christian soldier and the armor of God and the weapons of our warfare, right? Christianity, the kingdom moving, is not for the faint of heart. It's for warriors. It's for fighters, right? We're not supposed to be tame and quiet. There's a time for that, right? There's also a time to fight. You fight forward, right? We're supposed to be fighters. We're supposed to move forward all the time. And, and the world is telling us to shut up. And, and too often, and this is the sad thing, God will get his way. But too often, I think he has to work a little bit harder than he needs to because we're so quiet. We're quiet all the time. Listen, if, you're, if, you, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you know the truth. You know the truth that the people who hate you and hate him need to know. So what's a greater show of love? 
honoring their desire to be left alone so they can rot in hell forever, or, pardon me, piss them off and tell them the truth that could save them forever. Right? True, right? There's probably some people in there going, I can't believe you spoke that way. How about what I said, not how I said it? I'll just take that in, okay? So, so we're supposed to not shut up. I was, I was reading this, this, this week, this story. It's in Mark chapter 10 of this, this blind guy, uh, Bartimaeus. I don't know if you guys have ever read that story, but I would highly recommend it. So he's sitting on the side of the road, and he's a social outcast. He's a religious outcast, you know, because he, anything you had, any kind of sickness or disease, deformity, leprosy, crippled in any way, whatever it was, if you had all that stuff, like you couldn't go to temple. Like you couldn't come here and worship God. It was kind of, it's pretty mean. I mean, it was pretty mean. But you had to be like healthy to go to church. It's kind of lame. But that's the way it was, right? Every culture is a little bit different. And so here he is on the side of the road and, and Jesus is walking by. And Bartimaeus, good old blind Bartimaeus, right? He starts yelling out, you know, son of David, he called him. You know, Jesus, have mercy on me. And what do the people say? Shut up. Shut up. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. You're nothing. You don't get, right? Just trying to shut him up, shut him up, shut him up. But if, it's an awesome story, right? Because most of us shut up. And we shouldn't. This guy who probably should have or could have he yells all the more, screams louder, screams louder so much so that he got the attention of the Savior, and he healed him, right? He healed him through all the crowd of people saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, quit, stop, slow down, back off, quit, never, never. He screams all the more, and he's healed, right? That's the way we need to be. You need to be loud. Listen, if you know the truth, stop hiding the truth under what? Under the basket, right? Why, why would you light a lamp? Why would God light you and then you put a basket over yourself to be worthless for his kingdom? You know the truth. It set you free. Go set some people free, right? That's what we're supposed to do. That's the church. All right, so we see it. Push forward, push back. There's, there's one, that's, but that's not enough to, to, sh to shape my life around, is it? I need a little more than that. So go down to uh, 13. Uh, look, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's verses 16 through 43. You see Paul, Saul, Paul. He pushes forward, right? He pushes forward. He's telling, these people are telling him, be quiet. No, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. But he keeps going. He doesn't give up. And, and in this section of the book of Acts, we see Paul. He gives like this long dissertation this whole history of the he's trying to earn some credibility in their eyes showing them like listen i'm one of you i get it 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 right he's like he tells them the full story about how how god's people went to egypt and moses let him got let him out and then there's the whole story about king saul and king david you see him mention those guys and john the baptist and then here comes jesus along and and we crucified him he was buried and then he was resurrected he tells the whole story but then the most important part of the whole story is it culminates in this truth verse 38 that there's forgiveness of sin in this jesus so he pushes forward right so what happens? Look at verse 45. Verse 45. But then some of the Jews saw the crowds and they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he said. So you see the pushback, 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 pushback. Debate. Public. Listen, I get it online all the time because, again, I'm the big mouth. I get shredded online. I mean, I'm quoting specific Bible verses, and Christians are shredding me. Shut up. You're wrong. You're going to go to hell for all this. You're going to kill people. You should get arrested for manslaughter. I mean, just madness, right? Madness all the time. And so they start to slander him. So there it is again. Push forward. What? Push back. Push back. Let's move forward here. Very next verse. Uh, 1340, uh, 1346, what happens here? So they're slandered and argued against, public debate, stop, 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 be quiet. What do they do? They stop. Well, then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. Like, I guess they weren't sp speaking out boldly before, 
right? But now you done ticked him off, right? You done ticked off the Christian, and now he's speaking out boldly and declare. So he starts declaring some things, right? You can read that if you want. But at the end of the day, he starts preaching the gospel, okay? He's preaching the gospel to the people. Um, so when the, when, the God, when the Gentiles heard this, some of them were glad, and they, were, they thanked the Lord, and they got saved and all that kind of stuff. It says in verse 48 that those chosen for eternal life became believers. That's awesome. So the Lord's message spread throughout the region. So they're being pushed back, but they, they step up again and push forward boldly. And now the word of the Lord, the message of the gospel is spreading throughout the region. Like it's getting better and better all the time. Because why? They didn't give in to the pressure. They didn't give in to the opposition. They never back down. They never get quiet. They never give up. Always moving forward, right? But what what happens? Look at verse 50. Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. Listen, business is picking up, right? It's getting worse and worse and worse. First, it's like, hey, don't listen to them. The next thing is like, no, they're wrong. Listen to me now. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm right. They're wrong. Now it's like a mad mob, and they're running them out of town. Like, it's getting worse all the time, right? And, as, and if you've lived in this country for more than 20 years, you can see that pattern happening here. It's just kind of getting worse. What used to be good is now bad. We preach the Bible. We're called haters. We used to be liberating book of love. Now it's like, oh, you hate me. The perception of the kingdom and the perception of Jesus and the perception of the word of God has taken a total turn. And and you can see that here, and it's like that for us. But what should we do? Should we just be quiet and cower in our own homes and, and be afraid and be quiet? Never. Never be quiet. Always speak out boldly. Man, these words are in the Bible for a reason. Not to go, man, that Saul was awesome. He was bold. No, it's so you can be bold. Remember, truth shared, examples shown, right? He's the example of boldness because we're supposed to be bold, right? We're supposed to be bold. And I understand that not everyone has a big mouth like I do. I get help because I got a microphone. Everyone's not like that. I understand that some of you are a lot more quiet and, and, and introverted, and I get all that, right? And I have news for you. For those of you that know me very well, I'm extremely introverted. I'm extremely introverted, but once, but when I'm up here, dude, <laughs> it's different, right? Because, because the Spirit of God will empower someone to go beyond their normal, natural being to do something for him to advance his kingdom, right? If you'll just step forward and open your mouth, he'll give you the boldness you need to preach so the kingdom can advance, okay? And that's what we need, okay? So we see some push forward. He gives a full gospel call. People get saved. People start inciting a mob. They push back, push forward, push back, right? Let, let's just go on here. Um, let's see if there's any more. Verses 46 through, oh, I guess I did that one already. 40, yeah, 49, we see that. And then verse 50, they incite the mob, okay? So did the believers give up? Did they get quiet? Not at all, right? Look at 14.1. So, so after they go and they stir up the people, they run them out of town, right? They run them out of town. So you think, well, maybe they'll go to the next town and they'll, le- they'll learn their lesson. They'll shut their mouths because they, they get in trouble here. It's, gonna, it's getting bad, right? But what happens? I love this. The same thing happened in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas, he's now switched to Paul. Do you see it? It switched from Saul to Paul. Why? Bold. See what happened there? I just noticed that just now. When he got bold, he turned into Paul. That was awesome, right? Some of us need to turn into a Paul today. Some of us need to turn from a Saul to a Paul right here while we become bold with the gospel of Christ that's now in you, okay? So so 14.1, the same thing happened in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas went to the Jewish synagogue. They went to a building. Stop ripping down churches. We don't meet in a building. They went to the building, and what'd they do? preached, right? Say it like a bunch of preachers. They preached, right? They preached. They preached with such power that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. Awesome, right? Know what we're looking for? 
I don't, I don't even know everybody's condition in their heart here today. I think I might know, but I'm not quite sure. I'm hoping that maybe you're going to hear the word of God here this morning, and you're going to become a believer. That would be awesome. Maybe, maybe you are a believer, but you've wandered, and you haven't been walking with the Lord, and you haven't been talking with the Lord, and you haven't been serving the Lord, and you haven't been sharing the Lord. And maybe you're getting called back today to being that kind of person, that you're going to move from your Saul to your Paul today. Maybe that's going to happen. I hope it does. So the same thing happens there. They start preaching like crazy. People getting saved. Now what? Look at verse 2. There should be some pushback, right? Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message. Right? Just, I want you to see that for a second. Listen, loved ones. A lot of us don't share their faith because we feel hated and they're going to hate me. They're not going to respect me. Listen, did they spurn Saul or Paul and Barnabas? No, they did not. They spurned the message. They're not spurning you. They're spurning what you're saying. They're spurning your Savior. Leave, Jesus is big and tough, and he's a warrior. He's got shoulders like this. He can take the spurning. It's, it, it's not on you, man. It's not on you. They spurned the message, okay? They spurned the message. Be empowered this morning, loved ones, to go out and share the message that if they say no, they're really not saying no to you. They're saying no to him, and that's on them, not on you, okay? Your job is to be the, the, the herald of the good news, and then whatever they and God do with that, they can wrestle all they want, like Jacob, all night long. And, and maybe God will win that fight, and he'll bring him to salvation. Or maybe they'll just spurn him enough where he just says, okay, you want the world, you want all that sin, have it to you, choke on it, I'll be right here waiting for you when you're done. That's not up to you. Your job is what? Open your mouth. Just open your mouth and preach it. Okay? They spurn God's message and they poison the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. Did that stop? Did it stop them? There's some pushback there, right? They're arguing against it boldly. They're spurning God's message. They're telling people it's wrong. They're poisoning the minds. So they're actually speaking, right? They had to have said something, right? They didn't just wish it upon them. They said something. There's some public debate there probably. It's not like here in this room right now where I'm speaking and then an atheist gets up and gets to speak. That's not happening here. In this, in this sit- setting right here, that's exactly what's happening. They speak, the other people speak. And they poison the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. So there's some pushback. Let's see if it goes on. I love this. But the apostles stayed there a long time what are they doing? Preaching. Preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. Awesome. Preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. You know, I just can't, this is not the Bible, this is just me. I just can't help but think that there's something that they were probably saying like, hey, you know what? You know that God that you hate? You know what I'm saying? Just preaching boldly. Like it doesn't matter what you say or what you do about this Jesus. He loves you and there's nothing you can do to stop him. That's so awesome, right? So they're preaching this stuff. At least that's what I see there. So push forward, push back. The apostles stayed there a long time. They didn't, they didn't get scared. They didn't stop. They didn't get quiet. They preached boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the, and the Lord proved their message with signs and wonders. That's awesome, right? Watch this, verse 4. But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them, right? Like I just said, it could happen. They might become a believer. They might not. That's between them and God. Some people hear the gospel and say yes. Some people see the sweetness of God, the grace of God, and just go, no. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Watch the pushback. Here it comes, right? You should anticipate it now because this is the story. This is Jesus' story, this is their story, this is our story. They preach boldly, then a mob of Gentiles and Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stone them. Man, business is definitely picking up now, right? They went from shunning, telling them to be quiet, then arguing against them, then inciting a mob and running them out of town. Now they're getting stoned, right? It's getting bad. It's getting bad. And when the apostles learned of this, they fled to another area. To these other towns, you'll see it there. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? Look at verse 7. What's it say? Come on, someone say it out loud. They preached again. 
You can't stop these guys, right? Pressure doesn't stop them. Opposition doesn't stop them. Pushback doesn't stop them. Do you ever push on a horse? What do they do? They lean into you. That's what they do. That's supposed to be you. You're supposed to be like a horse. When pressure pushes you, you don't go. You lean into it. You fight it, right? That's what you're supposed to do. That's the, that's the Holy Spirit of God. I'm so not that creative. I just got that right there. That's for you guys, right? He loves you. He wants you to see what to do so you can live in victory. Okay, so let's, let's see one more here. Verse 14. Look at verse uh, 7. Look at verse 7 and verse 14, right? They preach the good news. You saw it there, right? And then they like, like keep going. They're preaching, they're preaching. They're in the good news. They're in the towns of Leicester and Derby. They're pre- in the surrounding areas. They're preaching the good news there, okay? Now, while they were there, not only are they preaching the good news, but remember a moment ago it said that, they, that God gave them the power to do signs and wonders to validate their, what they were saying, right? So here's one story in specific that there's this crippled guy, and, and they, 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 they say, you know, you're healed in the name of Jesus. This is what the apostles did back then, right? These guys were super spiritual studs. Rise in the name of Jesus, boom, you're healed. Like, it was amazing. And so they do this with this, du- this dude, and the crowd sees this. Instead of giving glory to God, which we should, they start giving glory to Paul and Barnabas, and they think that they're Greek gods. And so they want to try to worship Paul and Barnabas, and Barnabas and Paul are like, no, 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 no. <laughs> We're just people. Don't worship us. We're just people, right? We're just here doing, doing God's work. He say, it goes on and says, we're just here to bring you the good news. So it references the people back. Listen, we're just here to preach. That's all we're here to do. We're just here to preach. So look at verse 19. They go from verse 18, scarcely unable to restrain the people from sacrificing to them like they were God's. Very next verse, then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. So there's some public debate going on. They're preaching something different, and they actually sway the crowd back over. People are so easily swayed. Let your roots grow down deep into Christ, right? So that every wind of doctrine that comes your way, you don't just go, oh, okay. Dumb people do that. Don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. Watch this. Some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side, and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. And it's just getting worse and worse all the time. Look, verse 7, we're preaching. Verse 19, we're getting stoned to death. Did they stop? No! 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 Verse 21, after preaching the good news, and so they, they get stoned like he's thinking he was dead. How bad off is this dude, right? Just think about that. If I literally took Michael by the hand and dragged him across this floor like he was dead, like he wasn't just running away from the stones that are getting thrown at him. He's literally being dragged out of town like he's dead. And so th- you'd think, well, maybe he would at least take a sabbatical. You take a break. You take a little vacation from this stuff, right? Maybe heal up. No. After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples. Man, you can't stop these guys, right? You can't stop these guys. He's preaching the good news. People are getting saved. He's making disciples. What does it say? Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia, where they strengthened the believers, So you see that? They made disciples. That's what we're supposed to do. I told you that, right? Make disciples, share the gospel, make a convert, right? Regenerate, born again, make a disciple, right? And then what does it say? And then they went back to those places to strengthen the believers. That's the ongoing process of disciple making. Remember I talked about that? You come alongside. I teach Michael some things. Now he's got a young man. He's going to go start teaching. And Meredith's been teaching some stuff with Haley, and Haley's going to, she's got someone in in her cross here she's going after now too. She's going to go disciples making disciples. That's what we do. That's what's happening right here. So they, they make disciples, then they go back as a team of ministry, and they go back to strengthen the believers. 
what did they say? What was the strengthening? What did it look like? Well, here it is. They encouraged them to continue in the faith. Faced with persecution, told to be quiet. I made a decision a while ago, and now I'm starting to second guess that, right? Continue in the faith. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep moving forward. Keep pursuing Christ. Keep sharing Christ. Keep serving. Keep giving. Keep praying. Don't stop, right? Don't stop. And watch this. And reminding them that we must, here it is again, suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God of God. <clears throat> so the reason why we watch the weather is not to weaken the weather. It's to prepare us to defend ourselves from it. Correct? Is that what we do? If you played sports, why do we, as a team, why do we watch film? Is it to weaken the other team or is it to prepare us to defend ourselves against them right and so the reason like just like those things the reason God's word contains Acts 13 and 14 isn't to lessen the opposition but it's to prepare you and I for him for it right that's why we see it here right don't be surprised by the fiery trials that you will go through as if something was strange the pushback is coming when you push forward it's coming. And so for those who, who walk th- th- through life and they, they get saved and, and all of a sudden they're like peaches and cream and everything's great and, and everything's a garden scene and Jesus is so wonderful and he's, and, he'll, and, and he's full of love and he's full of caring and, and he'll provide for you and he'll bless you and everything's going to be great because I got Jesus and my life's so much better now and it's going to be so great to tell you about it and you're all going to accept that and it's going to be great and peachy and rosy. And, and listen, as you can see, some people do. But some people are going to hate you for it. You're going to get opposition when you, listen, if you have that mindset that you're going to, that just because Jesus is amazing and wonderful and cares for you, that it's going to be so wonderful to go evangelize and tell the world about him. Listen, the Bible says some people you're going to be the aroma of life. Like, wow, I was dying on the vine and you gave me the good news that helped me get saved, so now I'm living. Woo! But it also says that to some, you're going to be the stench of death. And they're going to hate you for it. Okay? So as we close, okay? As we close, know this, loved ones. Know this. As you push forward, you're going to have opposition. You're going to have opposition. Right? But revolutionaries, of which we are, right? Revolution Church. Revolutionaries need to be like Bartimaeus and yell all the more. Never quiet down. Never quiet down. Keep moving. Keep talking. Keep singing. Keep serving, right? See, our coach, Jesus, he can talk all the trash that he wants, right? He could say, I'm going to build my church and hell ain't going to stop it. The reason is, is because he and his disciples, his people, you and I, we're aware of our opposition's plans. We're aware of our opposition's ploys, but we constantly push forward. We never, ever stop. That's what we're supposed to do, loved ones. So today... You need to go from Saul to Paul. We need Christian soldiers to fight. And I heard, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can remember what he said. But he said, some people have chosen the peace of a draft dodger. And some of us in this room are that person today. You've, you've chosen, instead of fighting forward, and resisting the enemy's attempt, attempt to stop you and shut you down, you instead of engaging in the war, you have chosen the peace of a, dra- of a draft dodger. Heaven help you for making that decision. And it's time to engage the enemy right there on the front lines. Listen, bring the next verse, bring that next thing up on the screen. Someone, Carl, bring that up. What's the next one right there? I want you guys to say it with me. 
I want you to, as a matter of fact, why don't you stand up? Stand up, soldiers. Stand up, stand up, stand up. All right? In the best way you can, in, 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 in tune with each other, okay, I want you to say it out loud like you are standing in front of the walls of Jericho. And I want you to declare this thing out loud three times in a row, loud, rowdy. Let's go. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Amen? All right. Listen, loved ones. Stay right there. We want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. God, if, if any of us in this room or any of us that are watching, listening online or who will this week or whenever they decide to tune in, if any of us have chosen the cowardly peace of the draft dodger instead of engaging the enemy, fighting the good fight, a soldier of Christ wearing the full armor of God. Instead of choosing the weapons of our warfare, we have backed down and got quiet about what we know is truth. Heaven help us. And if that's me, if that's you, loved one, repent. Repent now. Acknowledge where you went wrong. And commit afresh right now to standing firm and, like Paul, fighting the good fight of faith. Pushing forward, always pushing forward, never relenting, always forward. Even though we get pushed back, we push forward again. With Christ as our example, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. He did not stop. Lord, you did not stop. Help us, Lord. Strengthen our spine and help us never to stop pushing the kingdom of God forward as you have told us to in your word.